Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last lecture of uh, the first week of Atoms to Materials. Today, we're going to finish with the hydrogen atom. We're going to describe excited states. And uh, we're going to use the uh, orbitals for hydrogen to discuss multi-electron uh, atoms. Okay, um, So let's get to it. Last uh, class, last lecture, we talked about um, the uh, spherically symmetric uh, states in hydrogen. We talked about how the ground state had uh, no nodes. Okay, it was an exponentially decaying function. That uh, wave function is called n equals 1. n is the quantum principal uh, number. And then as we move up in energies to n equals 2, this, the first excited state, and n equals 3, we increase the number of nodes in the wave functions, uh, just like uh, what happened in the particle in a box. So for the ground state, uh, the sign of the wave function is positive everywhere, no nodes, and the, the wave function uh, goes down as you move away from the proton. Uh, for the n equals 2, these are wave functions with one node you know, in three dimensions, so that's going to be a plane, a planar surface, and in the case of these spherically symmetric wave functions, the plane is a sphere, so the wave function starts off as positive and becomes negative. And the uh, second excited state has one more node and again goes positive, then negative, and then positive again. Uh, but not all uh, solutions of hydrogen, of course, are spherically symmetric, but there's angular dependence. There are uh, wave functions where the electrons have an angular momentum uh, around the proton as opposed to being uh, spherically symmetric. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, think about these excited state, uh, states in terms of the number of nodes and the requirement that the wave functions be normal to one another. Okay, uh, Remember that because the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator, the, uh, way, the orbitals, the eigenfunctions, need to be orthogonal to each other. That means that the product of the two functions integrated over all of space needs to add up to zero. Okay, So if you think about the 1s and the 2s wave functions, the, the, the first two that we're seeing here, uh, if you do the product of these two, we're going to have positive uh, near the uh, proton, where both wave functions are positive, and then the product is going to turn negative as the n equals 2 wave function turns negative, and uh, this happens in a way that if you uh, integrate the product over all of space, you get zero. So the two n equals 1, n equals 2 wave function uh, are uh, orthogonal to each other. Now, uh, let's think about functions that have one node and uh, we'll uh, come to the conclusion that there's more uh, solutions than a spherical node, right? So there are other ways, there are other uh, manners in which I can place a node in space so that I have positive and negative wave function uh, that uh, satisfies uh, ortho orthogonality with all of these other functions, okay? Um, so. If you think about it a little bit, it'll be very clear that a wave function where uh, that has a planar node uh, normal to one of the Cartesian directions will satisfy this condition. Okay, um, so the, uh, if I'm looking for wave functions with a single node in three dimensions, I have multiple options. Uh, I have a node that's a sphere, but I can also have a node that's a plane that passes, cuts through the proton. Okay, so the proton would be here in the middle. Um, if you think about doing the product between this new uh, wave function and uh, the previous ones, you're going to convince yourself very easily uh, that the products uh, are zero. Okay, so let's do an example. 
let's estimate the product of the new wave function that we came up with and the uh, uh, spherically symmetric uh, wave function with one node. Um, so let's say this is the node of the spherically symmetric wave function. Now I'm going to compute, uh, calculate the sign in each of these regions. So this region here is going to be positive because both wave functions are positive. In here I'm going to have negative because the new wave function is negative and the uh, spherically symmetric wave function is positive. And then I have positive over here and negative over here. Okay, so very clearly this new wave function that is positive on one side, let's say plus x, uh, and negative on the other side, let's say plus uh, negative x, uh, this wave function is normal to the uh, wave functions we had before, and it also has one node. Okay, and now you can think that if I have a, a wave function that has a node along x, I can also have a wave function that has a node along z, uh, with a, a along y or a, a along z. And it turns out that there are three such wave functions, okay, that are going to be uh, two uh, n equals two wave function. That means a single node, and uh, they're going to be aligned along x. Y and Z, okay? And I can only put three because these wave functions need to be also orthogonal to one another. So I cannot have more than three and they have to be orthogonal to one another. So uh, just uh, with our knowledge of uh, the number of nodes and the fact that we live in 3D, we come to the conclusion that uh, for n equals two wave function, that's wave functions with one node, I have uh, one possibility of a spherical node, and then I have three uh, additional wave functions that I ha are going to have nodes uh, normal to the x direction, y direction, and z direction. Okay. Um, this let's give names to these wave functions. The spherically symmetric family of wave functions are called S. These are called S states. Uh, the wave functions that have uh, like the one we just discussed. Uh, have an angular momentum of one, and they're called p states. Okay, all right. So let's do the same exercise once more. Now for n equals three, um, and uh, again you can play the same game and uh, come up with wave functions that are have nodes in addition to a spherical node. Now I have to have two nodes. Uh, the s wave function that will be the three s wave function has two spherical nodes and uh, the 3p wave functions have a spherical node okay that you can see here plus a plane okay and now with uh, given that I have two nodes that I, then I can also put the nodes along different planes and those are called d functions okay now, Remember, for p states, I can pick either one of the three planes, x, y, and z. So I have three p states, okay? And with the d counting the number of states, it's a little bit more difficult, uh, but the solution is that I have five d states, okay? So again, uh, the fact that we live in three dimensions and the fact that these wave functions need to be all orthogonal to one another and that I that the number of nodes essentially tells me the energy, uh, I can uh, understand the uh, ground state and the excited states for hydrogen. Okay, so uh, let's formalize this a little bit more. Uh, in order the the general solution of the hydrogen atom, I need three quantum numbers to fully uh, distinguish these wave functions. Uh, the first quantum number is the principal quantum number n. Uh, this quantum number gives me the energy of the wave function. Okay. So all wave functions with the same principal quantum number will have exactly the same energy. Uh, the next wave function is called the I'm sorry, the next quantum number is called L. It's the angular momentum quantum number, and the values for L uh, go from zero 
to n minus 1. Okay? So if the principal quantum number uh, is 1, then I only have L equals 0, that is the S state. Okay? We call that S. L equals 1, we call that P. And L equals 2, we call that D. Okay? And finally, the last uh, quantum number is the projection of this uh, magnetic uh, quantum number along the z direction. And this quantum number is called z, uh, I'm sorry, m. And uh, m can take values from uh, negative l to plus l, changing by integers. Okay? So again, for uh, p states, I can have negative 1, 0, and 1, okay? And remember that P states, we said I have three possibilities, X, Y, and Z, and they, the number, they're correlated, okay? They're not exactly the same orbitals, but, uh, but they're correlated to one another, okay? So, uh, essentially, uh, with this information, we can classify this, all the excited states for hydrogen, and uh, what I'm doing here in this slide is summarizing those results and putting them in a position that uh, is uh, correlated with their energy, okay? So the ground state uh, is here at the bottom. The ground state energy is negative 13.6 eV. This is called 1 s orbital okay this the in in spectroscopy so n equals one and then the angular momentum s okay um, the first excited state i have two s orbitals okay n equals two and uh, zero angular momentum and i also have two p orbitals okay and this to p orbitals, I have three of them, x, y, and z. Okay. The next shell up, I have 3s. Remember, those are about 1.5 uh, electron volts or so. I have 3s, uh, principal quantum number 3, s meaning L equals 0. Then I have 3p, and I have 3 D states, okay? And we could keep going to the fourth shell and then you have F states and whatnot. Uh, something to keep in mind that for hydrogen and only for hydrogen, uh, the, the energy of the states are uh, only governed by the principal quantum number, okay? All right. So th this concludes our very, very quick uh, introduction to the hydrogen atom uh, in the uh, additional reading material that I mentioned in lecture two. Uh, you can learn quite a bit more uh, about uh, what's going on and uh, about these orbitals and uh, look at the uh, formal derivations. But I think uh, we, we have the information now we need uh, to move on and think about multi-electron uh, atoms. Uh, in this slide, I'm just uh, adding, uh, just listing the functional forms for all of these uh, orbitals that we just discussed, uh, so that you have them for the homework assignments. Uh, all of these functions are uh, can be obtained uh, analytically, and we know the solutions for all of these orbitals that we discussed uh, in terms of geometry. Uh, the, this table that I'm uh, showing here is taken from uh, this book by Karplas and Porter, and uh, I uh, recommend you, this is a book where you can learn uh, additional details and, and find full derivations of these wave functions. Okay, so let's move on, and let's talk about multi electron atoms, okay? So so what happens is, is we move from hydrogen to helium and then to lithium is that um, the 
shape of these orbitals that we found for hydrogen more or less uh, stay uh, the same. And the uh, ordering in energy of these orbitals also stay more or less as we discussed, although we'll, we'll talk about slight changes that occur. So we're going to use these states uh, for hydrogen to talk about multi-electron systems. And, uh, okay, so we're going to talk about the electronic uh, configuration of these simple atoms. So we're going to start with hydrogen, okay? The ground state of hydrogen is a single electron that I'm going to describe with this li little arrow pointing up. And uh, what I would say, uh, the way I would uh, describe its electronic structure is 1s1, okay? That means one electron, that's the superscript in the 1s orbital, okay? The next atom in the periodic table is helium. Uh, helium has uh, you know, two protons in the nucleus uh, and two electrons. So uh, I need to put one additional electron. So I'm going to pick the lowest possible state for my second electron and the uh, electronic configuration of helium is 1s2. That means two electrons in the 1s orbital. Okay. Remember, Pauli uh, allows me to put two electrons in the same orbital as long as they have opposite spin. Okay. So now the next uh, atom up, ne the next atom in the periodic table with three electrons is lithium. So now lithium, uh, the third electron comes in and it needs to decide uh, whether it goes to the 2s or the 2p, okay? And in principle, for hydrogen, uh, those states are all degenerate. They all have the same energy. Uh, but we'll think a little bit more about what happens with lithium uh, and see whether uh, this remains uh, the case. So again, uh, 2s and 2p are, have exactly the same energy for hydrogen, where the electron sees a bare uh, proton as the potential, 1 over r potential. But let's think about what happens uh, for the lithium atom. Okay, So what I'm uh, showing here in the plots is the uh, probability density function of finding an electron at distance r from the proton, uh, and this is the 1s state, okay? And uh, in the second, uh, in the bottom uh, panel, I am showing the 2s state, and also the 2p state in green, okay? So, Let's again go back to lithium. I have two electrons in the 1s orbital, okay? So I'm going to say this guy is occupied, okay? That's the electronic density at zero here. I have the proton, okay? And this, this is distance from the proton. as a function in units of the Bohr radius. So now my third electron, electrons are indistinguishable, okay, but uh, let's talk about this just that it simplifies the description. The third electron needs to decide whether it goes to the 2s orbital, that's the uh, red shape at the bottom, or to the 2p orbital, that's the green. And uh, what we know is that if uh, all I had was a bare proton. These two states will have exactly the same energy. Uh, but I don't have a bare proton. What I have is a 3 plus nucleus, a nucleus with a, a charge of 3 plus, surrounded by uh, two electrons in the 1s orbital. Okay? So when this third electron comes by, if it's far away, okay, let's say the electron is over here, that third electron only sees uh, an effective charge that's uh, plus one. So that third electron, if it's far away, it feels exactly the same way as with hydrogen. However, as it approaches uh, the proton and it starts overlapping with the electrons, 
uh, at, at this size, at the size of about the Bohr radius or so, it starts to realize that this is not a hydrogen atom uh, and that the effective potential is different. So this third electron is going to be, um, you know, these two orbitals are going to be comparable in energy as far as you're far away because they are like hydrogen. Uh, but the orbital that spends more time near the nucleus uh, will have an advantage because the nucleus is really uh, three plus, so that's much better than hydrogen, and uh, and the orbital would really not like to spend time at the Bohr radius where the other two electrons are uh, centered, and uh, because that will lead to repulsion. And uh, so to really distinguish between these two electrons, you have to do the math. Uh, but the, uh, the there is a way, uh, an intuitive way, of distinguishing the two, and it is that. The 2s orbital has this little bump, which is the you know it's before the first node, and there's a relatively high probability for that electron to be very very close to the nucleus, where the potential energy is very very attractive. Uh, whereas the you can see that the 2p has a much lower probability for the electron being close to the to the uh, protons. So it's this this little pick that makes the difference and what happens is that the 2s orbital is actually lower in energy than the 2p orbital okay for multi-electron systems. And uh, this is a general trend that the higher the the angular momentum the higher the energy within the same shell okay so 2s is lower than 2p uh, 3s is lower than 3p and lower than 3d. And all of this is caused by shielding, by the inner core, inner electrons shielding the nucleus from the uh, outer um, the, the outer shells. Okay, that causes the outer shells to uh, break the symmetry that they had in hydrogen and break the degeneracy that they had in hydrogen. Uh, so this kind of shows uh, the, how the levels split up. Uh, what we see on the left is hydrogen. Okay, so over here we have hydrogen. Um, all the states, the uh, n equals one state, of course there's only one. n equals two state, they're all the same. n equals three states, they're all the same. And uh, in multi-electron systems on the right-hand side, you see that the 2s and 2p split, the 3s, 3p, and 3d also split, and the 4s, 4d, 4p, I'm sorry, p, d, and f also split, okay? And between the 3 and the 4, there is the, the shells start crossing, okay? So things get more complicated. Uh, so the take-home message is that within a shell, the higher the angular momentum, the higher the energy, and this is due to the shielding of the nuclear charge, nuclear potential, by the inner core electrons. Okay, so now we have all the information we need uh, to to go through and start putting electrons on at least the first uh, few rows of atoms. Okay, so hydrogen. I put one electron pointing up. The it's called one uh, s one. I'm sorry. One s one. Helium. One electron up. One electron going down. One s two. Okay. Uh, lithium. One electron up. One electron down in one s. When I get to the two shell. I have 2s and 2p, I know that 2s is better. So uh, uh, lithium is going to be 2s. Uh, so the configuration, the electronic configuration is 1s2, 2s1, okay? And then I know uh, everything going down is going to be completely full in the 1s uh, orbitals. Okay, so beryllium is next. Okay, look at the periodic table down here. That's where we are. So beryllium, I'm going to do up and down. 
in the two s boron okay the two s uh, are going to be full okay from down from from that from from now on in boron i need to put one more electron and of course it doesn't matter in which p states whether px py or pz they're all degenerate they all have the same energy so i can put it everywhere i can put it any spin that i want okay now carbon so carbon i have one electron in the p states and i need to put another electron okay now so i have let's say one electron in px okay the electron is there the second electron is not going to is not going to want to be in px because of electron electron repulsion so the second electron that i put in it's going to be either in PY or PZ, okay? So that's, that's uh, relatively simple to understand. It's just pure uh, electrostatic uh, repulsion. Now the question is, uh, for the second electron, what is the spin? So do I put, I have one electron with spin up along X. Do I put the second electron with, do I put them with spin up? This is one electron along X. Is the electron along Y also with the same spin? Or do I put them uh, spin up and spin down? Okay. And uh, the, the answer is a purely quantum mechanical phenomena that we're going to dis discuss now um, only uh, in an intuitive way. But in the homework assignment, you're going to do an exercise uh, to, uh, to think about these two electron systems and how uh, this occurs. Uh, let me tell you what the answer is. Uh, if I have a, an electron in Px with spin up, the other electron in Py is going to have, is going to want to have the same spin. Okay. So the answer is that the spins, it's going to be parallel spins. Okay, so the two electrons are going to want to have the same spin, and the reason that why they want to have the same spin is kind of complicated, but they have correlations. It's called exchange interaction. Um, you know from the Pauli exclusion principle that if two particles have the same spin, they cannot be on the same orbital. Okay, I can put them in the same orbital only if they have different spin. So if they have the same spin, they have this. Uh, knowledge of each other that's called exchange that they have to avoid one another and uh, what happens is when you do the math if two spins in two different orbitals have if two electrons in two different orbitals have the same spin uh, they are going to avoid each other more it's a correlation uh, than if they have uh, different spins where Pauli doesn't really care. Okay, so two electrons with the same spin try to avoid each other a little bit more than if they have different spins. Uh, that uh, rule is summed up in in what's called uh, Hans rule, and so and what Hans rule says is that given for a given set of orbitals, we're going to place the electrons in a way that maximizes the total spin. Okay. Uh, these rules are a little bit more complex than we just discussed, but essentially these rules that we applied allow you to understand the electronic structure um, of atoms. Okay, so uh, one interesting uh, result is that carbon is actually uh, has a non-zero spin; it's magnetic. The carbon atom, nitrogen, all spins up. Oxygen. I'm going to add one more electron and of course now I don't have a choice I'm going to put it in the same orbital and with opposite spin so also we would predict that uh, oxygen has a total spin of one okay each electron contributes one half uh, of magnetic moment and so the two uh, uh, electrons with parallel spin would contribute to one fluorine is up, up, down. Okay, and then neon, of course, at the end of the second row, full shell. Okay, so 
uh, with uh, with this we're, we're finish uh, week one uh, there's a lot of information here we started uh, in in uh, lecture two to uh, discuss about quantum mechanics and why we need quantum mechanics um, we uh, discussed a couple of uh, postulates that we will be using uh, to describe quantum mechanics and then we solved a couple of simple problems starting from the particle in a box then going to hydrogen and then using hydrogen's wave functions to talk about the electronic structure of multi-electron systems so we've uh, come a long way and uh, what we're going to do in the in week two is to use our knowledge to talk about bonding, how what happens when I bring two atoms together to form molecules and also to form solids. So, uh, homework one, uh, the homework associated with week one uh, will be available to everyone who registered in the course and uh, it's going to uh, help solidify uh, some of these concepts uh, that we have been discussing, uh, get you a little bit of practice uh, thinking about quantum mechanics and thinking about the the uh, orders of magnitude and, and the implications of what we have discussed. And also, you're going to do your first uh, density functional theory calculation uh, to look at the very simple calculation of an oxygen atom to estimate uh, this exchange um, correlation, the importance of putting electrons with the same spin versus electrons with different spins and that cannot be you know, done in the back of the envelope so you're going to use a, a, a research grade simulation code uh, to quantify that number and develop a little bit of an intuition for uh, these energy terms. Thank you very much and I'll see you in week two. Bye.